there can be a lot of confusion about what vaccine to get. You have the additional dose and you have the, the booster shots. There is some confusion with our patients between the additional dose for immunocompromised and the booster shot. Now you add to that the availability of three additional vaccines. Some confusion over boosters this week. Let's talk about that with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, thanks for joining us again this morning. You know, there has been a lot of news about boosters this week. Fair amount of confusion. All three are now approved, and the CDC has signed off on mixing and matching vaccines. Explain who can get them now and your best guidance on which booster people should get. Well, first of all, it's a level playing field now, George, because all three of the products that are available to the American public, the mRNAs from Moderna and from Pfizer, as well as the J&J. &J. And first, we had the Pfizer approval, which means that people 65 years of age or older and those who have underlying conditions that put them at a higher risk and 18 up to 64 of people who either live in or work in a circumstance that put them at a higher risk. The criteria for Moderna are the same as the criteria for Pfizer. Most recently, the J&J &J authorization means that anybody 18 years of age or older who's received their primary uh, shot within the past two months can get it. So it really shouldn't be confusing. All three products. The mix and match means that under the situation, if you were originally vaccinated with one product, could you and would it be appropriate and safe and effective to get boosted in the third shot for the mRNA and the second shot for J&J &J by another product? And the answer is it's perfectly fine. We would hope that people, if available, would get the boost from the original product. But if not, there's the flexibility of what we're calling mixing and matching. In other words, I, I, getting something other than the time of the first shot. Can I press you on that? Because I've read some studies that suggest that it's actually better to mix. Like, say, if you got the Johnson & Johnson the first time around, it's better to get Moderna the second time. Well, George, if you look at the level of antibodies that are induced, in fact, you do. If you originally had J&J &J and you get, for example, a Moderna or a Pfizer, the level of antibodies, namely the proteins that you would predict would protect you, those levels go up higher with the Moderna boost to J&J &J than the J&J &J boost. However, it's a little bit more complicated because in the clinical trial that J&J &J did, the clinical effect of the second dose of J&J &J was quite substantial. So it really becomes an issue of what's the most convenient, what do you feel is best for you. If you have any question about it, you consult your physician. I think the good news about this, George, is that it allows a considerable degree of flexibility for people to get what we hope they will get, namely a booster that will increase and optimize their protection. Let's talk about kids. Pfizer reported on Friday that its vaccine is safe and effective for the younger children ages 5 to 11. FDA is meeting next week. So should we expect kids to start getting vaccinated in November? I would think so, George. You never want to get ahead of the FDA in their regulatory decisions, nor do you want to get ahead of the CDC and their advisors on what the recommended would be. But if you look at the data that's been made public and announced by the company, the data look good as to the efficacy and the safety, the FDA and their advisory committee will be meeting next week on October the 26th, and then their regulatory decision will be handed over to the CDC, likely November 2nd or 3rd. So if all goes well and we get the regulatory approval and the recommendation from the CDC, it's entirely possible, if not very likely, that vaccines will be available for children from five to 11 within the first week or two of November. The controversy over whether the U.S. was funding risky COVID research in Wuhan was kicked up again this week when the NIH released a letter about that research which showed that the subcontractor had not disclosed some results in a timely manner. Now, now some critics and analysts have seized on that to say you and others have misled the public about U.S. funding of this so-called gain-of-function research. The NIH says that's false. Our medical unit backs that up. But Senator Rand Paul stepped up that criticism in a new interview with Oxios on HBO. Let's play it. Dr. Fox, you should be fired by the president. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, is 
just for lack of judgment of nothing else. I, you know, he's probably never going to admit that he lied. He's going to continue to dissemble and try to work around the truth and massage the truth. I want to give you the opportunity to respond to Senator Paul, but also yeah. explain what was the United States funding, what wasn't it funding, and why that's important. Well, I, I obviously totally disagree with Senator Paul. He's absolutely incorrect. Neither I nor Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, lied or misled about what we've done. The framework under which we have guidance about the conduct of research that we fund, the funding at the Wuhan Institute was to be able to determine what is out there in the environment in bat viruses in China. And the research was very strictly under what we call a framework of oversight of the type of research. And under those conditions, which we've explained very, very clearly, does not constitute research of gain of function of concern. There are people who interpret it that way, but when you look at the framework under which the guidance is, that is not the case. So I have to respectfully disagree with Senator Paul. He is not correct that we lied or misled the Congress. It's just not correct, uh, George, That's I'm sorry. Right, and it showed that what was being researched was very far from the COVID, the SARS-CoV virus, but it did show that the subcontractor yeah. did not re release some results in a timely manner. What did we learn from the letter? Does it show that some of the research we were funding was riskier than we know? No, it isn't. We, we knew what, 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 what the risk was and what the oversight is. Certainly, they should have put their progress report in in a timely manner, no denial of that, and there will be administrative uh, consequences of that. But one of the things that gets mixed up in this, George, and it really needs to be made clear to the American public, there's all of this concern about what's gain of function or what's not, with the implication that that research led to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, which, George, unequivocally, Anybody that knows anything about viral biology and phylogeny, phylogeny of viruses know that it is molecularly impossible for those viruses that were worked on to turn into SARS-CoV-2 because they were distant enough molecularly that no matter what you did to them, they could never, ever become SARS-CoV-2. And yet, when people talk about gain of function, they make that implication which I think is unconscionable to do, to say, well, maybe that research led to SARS-CoV-2. You can ask any person of good faith who's a virologist, and they will tell you absolutely clearly that that would be molecularly impossible. So things are getting conflated, George, that should not be conflated. Dr. Fauci, thanks as always for your time and your information. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.